Hi, this is Dr. Rugenstein, and today we are at Tenbrook Mansion, um, originally built by Abraham Tenbrook, 1798. Uh, he was a mayor of Albany at one point, and he was also a major general of the Revolutionary War. And we'll learn more history about that as we go in. But as we walk in, let me turn around here, and we're going to take a look at the uh, garden as we go in. Always must be taken home, not a problem. Absolutely gorgeous garden. Now, to be honest, I do not know if we will be able to video inside, but I will take pictures and I will talk about it afterwards. This is a grape arbor, and you can see the grapes growing right there. Beautiful garden. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good. And you? Very good. Beautiful day. Here are the rules. No smoking, no vaping, no alcohol, no beer. Well, that makes sense. Tree. I think it's an oak tree. It's a rather old one, if it is. Let's see what they say about the year. No, it's a silver maple. I cannot imagine how old that tree is. Silver maple. Here is the entrance to the museum. See some of the city skyline here. Abraham Tenbrook, 1734 to 1810, built this grand mansion. Let me just poke it over there. Uh, in the federal style, after the destruction of his family home on Broadway in the Great Fire of 1797, descended from one of Albany's founding New Netherland families, he was a businessman, landholder, and patriot soldier. Administered the, uh, was administrator of the Manor of Rensselaerwick. Say that fast. From 1769 to 1784, elected to Albany City Council in 1759, represented the. Uh, Rensselaerick in New York Pro Provincial Assembly where he stood for American rights served on the Committee of Correspondence in 1775 delegate to Provincial Congress and Continental Congress in, in Philadelphia in this critical time of the Revolutionary War he was a major military leader in Upper New York Region command, uh, command of Albany County Militia 
Rose, the Brigadier General, led militia to several Hudson Valley counties. Uh, soldiers fought the Battle of Saratoga. He was elected to the state senate and was appointed mayor of Albany. And he welcomed George Washington to Albany June 27, 1782. And so, this is who we'll be doing here today, what we'll be looking at. Um, naturally, the city has grown up around it. around to the front eventually here. Um, but understand that at one time this had a view all the way down to the Hudson River. And now it's all built up. Brigadier General Abraham Pembrook built and occupied this house. Member of New York Colon Colonial Assembly at the Battle of Saratoga, October 1777. First President Bank of Albany, Mayor of Albany, 1779-1783, And again, as I said, at one time, you would be able to see all the way down to the to the uh, Hudson River. This is the front of the house here. We don't go in this way, of course. Of a grand stairway going in. Tours, of course, we're going around this way. I wonder what he would have thought if he came back today. So there's a better look at the outside. And so, uh, there's that, there's that maple tree again. That has got to be old. That has got to be old. And lots of cameras. You can't go anywhere today without being on camera. So let's go inside and we'll see if they'll let us take tours. Well, they'll let us take a tour. We'll see if they'll let us photograph as we go inside. So uh, let me pause as we, uh, we go in. Okay, we'll go inside and we shall see another plaque. Robert Olcott. Oh. I am right back to Hello. Hello. How are you? Are you Good. here for a tour? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We've been here at Christmas, but never at just a regular time of year. Yes. Yet, so. Yes. Well, let me call ahead. Our two tour guides are up above right now. Let me just call ahead and let them know that you're here. Um, the time is now 1044, so the tour doesn't start for 15 minutes anyway. Okay. So let me just call them, though, just to make sure we didn't have anybody uh, planned for today. Maybe. So that's good. So please sign in, yes? Yes. Um, um, 
we we've just started doing the tours on Thursdays this week this month, and so we have had quite a few uh, that have signed up online or walked in. Uh, some people use our gardens. We have one lady that comes on her lunch hour and sits outside if it's nice, and mm -hmm. so she said she's going to bring some co-workers here oh. someday to actually tour the place. It's nice. <laughs> well, but. I came from a small town that had one museum, and I was amazed at the number of people who had never been in. I know, and uh, local yeah. people. But yeah, um, I'm we do to get a lot of people from Vermont. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are we all set? Well, uh, yeah. yeah, we are. We can all get right. started. We go outside to get started. Yeah. Okay. okay. Have fun. Oh yeah. Well, hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. My name is Aaron, as I think Pat mentioned inside. Uh, you're from uh, Troy, correct? Yes. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'll try to keep it brief outside so we're not suffering from the smog. Uh, no. <clears throat> I know it's bothering my throat uh, on occasion. Yeah. Um, uh, now, is there anything in particular you would like me to try to focus on for your tour today? Or are you just really interested in the... Just the whole shebang. All right, I will do my absolute best. All right. Um, so here at Tenbrook Mansion, we start outside very intentionally, uh, not just because we have very nice gardens, uh, albeit when it's sunnier and not choked with smoke. Um, beautiful gardens. Uh, and we start out here by thinking who uh, was living here for centuries prior to European occupation. Um, so here in the Albany area and on the uh, east bank of the Hudson as well, uh, this was the home to the Mohican people, who were an Algonquin tribe. Um, so they would have been living and farming here in the region. Uh, plenty of fish and uh, good transportation up and down the Hudson and up the Mohawk. Um, good fishing, of course. Lots of game in the area, so good, good eating and hunting here. There's groundhog somewhere. We have a prodigious family. <laughs> they may be hiding today, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very good place to live here in Albany for the Mohican. A uh, little bit further to the west, more towards Connecty, where, uh, was the home of the Mohawk, or the easternmost of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois nations. Um, and as two groups of people who are uh, both similar and also very different, uh, they have periodic time periods of uh, peaceful coexistence and trading, as well as warfare, um, as, as that happens. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> they lived here for centuries, uh, both, both groups. Uh, and in 1609, an Englishman by the name of Henry Hudson, working for the Dutch East India Company, comes sailing up the river that we now, of course, call the Hudson. Um, now, he is uh, on his voyage looking for the Northwest Passage, uh, working for the East India Company for a new, new trade routes to Asia. Of course, he does not find it on that trip, uh, and spoilers, any others. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a whole bay for him up in, Huts uh, up in Canada. Um, but he uh, came and he met with the Mohican and saw that this was a very good place to live. There's lots of resources in the area. Uh, and he went back to the Netherlands and said, look, I didn't find the Northwest Passage. I'll try again. Uh, but there's lots of good resources here. Uh, lots of beavers for all the hats that are very popular at the time. Um, so you guys should really, you know, invest in at least, you know, getting resources for, for yourself, uh, which is what the Dutch were very interested in. Um, compared to the English, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, a uh, very different uh, type of colonization. They were uh, None of it was a national endeavor. Everything was controlled by private companies. Uh, so you had the Dutch East India Company controlling all the Asian and Pacific trade. Uh, and then in 1621, uh, the Dutch formed the Dutch West India Company, which is all their North, uh, South American, and Caribbean trade uh, interests. Um, now their goal is to just build wealth for the Netherlands, uh, not make a new France, a new Spain, a new... Um, uh, New, uh, England, as the other nations did, although, of course, their colony was eventually called New Netherlands, because, of course, you have to name it after yourself. <laughs> um, so the uh, Dutch West India Company, they start by just kind of sending out trading parties and explorers. Uh, they very quickly uh, overhunt uh, or overtrap a lot of the beaver populations, gets pushed further west and north, um, becomes very difficult to uh, maintain long-term, or uh, difficult to solely be uh, utilizing or what is the word I'm looking for either way it's very difficult you couldn't just have your economy based on the beaver trade um, as it gets pushed further and further away from the Albany area here um, 
And to do, uh, to, uh, the Dutch decide, all right, well, we want to control this territory. We want to maintain the trade here. Um, even if it's taking longer for us to get these furs in. Um, to that end, the Dutch institute the patroon system. Have you heard of the patroon system? So the patroon system, it's not just our basketball team here in Albany. They have <laughs> patroons. Um, the patroon system was a system of land ownership that the Dutch West India Company set up. Uh, whereby large uh, or very wealthy individuals could essentially purchase large tracts of land for low prices from the company, uh, provided that those landowners would then be able to contract 50 people to begin with to come and permanently settle that land, um, which is also what led to the different settlement patterns that you see it from New England to New Netherlands here. So if you see, uh, think about New England, everything is very town-based, everything's communal. Um, you, have, you have the you know, town green and every, you know, very small knit community and farms on the outside of the community. In New Netherland, it was very much the patroon who told you what you were doing and where you were going to live. Uh, so it was the, in the Dutch eyes, it was the best way to get the most out of the land. Um, so you're going to go over here and farm wheat, you're going to go over there and farm tobacco, which they did try here, um, and then you're going to go over there and have a sawmill or a lumber mill. Um, everything was being controlled by the patroons. Um, now the patroon uh, who was here in Albany and on the other side of the river was the Van Rensselaer patroonship. Um, started by Killian Van Rensselaer, who is from Amsterdam. He's a diamond and pearl merchant. Um, so very, very wealthy. Uh, albeit he never stepped foot on his patroonship here in the New World. Um, at its height, the Van Rensselaer patroonship stretched uh, close to a million square acres. Uh, so that's from Schenectady in the west to western Vermont and Massachusetts, which used to be part of New York. Uh, and from Saratoga County down to Katska mm -hmm. at its height. So immense amount of wealth and uh, prosperity here in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so the Van Rensselaers, they were building their fortune or continuing to build their fortune here. Uh, another family that moved into the region uh, was the Tenbrook family. Uh, now the Tenbrooks uh, were from a slightly uh, outside of what was considered the Netherlands at the time. Uh, they spoke a slightly different form of Dutch, although they certainly would have understood each other. Um, and they were bakers, so not quite as high uh, social status as those uh, diamond and pearl merchants of the Van Rensselaers, but you could still be very, very wealthy as a baker. Everyone's eating bread. Um, however, as bakers, you couldn't quite hold that social status of being uh, a mayor or a governor or a general. You couldn't, you weren't just seen in that in that sort of uh, standing. Um, now the Tenbrooks, they uh, traveled to the New World, or New World as the Dutch called it, um, not to be, uh, not contracting with the patroons. They moved to Fort Orange. Um, which was about a mile south of us at the time, uh, which is a walled city. Um, so that was the only free portion of uh, the surrounding area that wasn't controlled by the Van Rensselaers. That was a basically a company town, as it were. Um, albeit not the type of company town that we would think of today, where you get paid in company script and shop in company stores, but it was owned by the Dutch West India Company, and then you could buy land from them rather than from the patrol. And very quickly, the Tenbrooks diversify themselves, becoming not only bakers, but they move into other business and merchant ventures, uh, become bankers. They move up in their social status and become uh, mayors and generals. Um, both Abraham's father and grandfather were mayors here in Albany. Um, he was a uh, twice mayor of Albany, albeit he was never elected. He was uh, appointed twice after uh, former mayors died. Um, and uh, several of Abraham's relatives uh, or ancestors were uh, commissioners of Indian affairs. Um, so we're speaking multiple languages, uh, Dutch, they probably spoke English, as well as either Iroquois or um, Mohawk or some form of indigenous languages as well. And so very prosperous family, building up their, uh, their social standing. Uh, now, 1734, uh, Abraham here is born in what is then Albany proper, which uh, again is about a mile, uh, three quarters of a mile by then, um, south of us, on the other side of Sheridan's Hollow, um, which used to be the Foxkill Creek, uh, now it's a culvert. <laughs> um, so they were, uh, he was born 1734, south of us here. The same year, Elizabeth Van Rensselaer is born on the other side of the river in the seat of the Van Rensselaer Manor, her father's Stephen Van Rensselaer Patroon. Um, now they would have grown up in the same social circles, rubbing elbows at events, uh, and in 1763 they get married at the age of 29. Um, now, a little bit later for, uh, many couples to be married at the time, albeit uh, Abraham is marrying up and Elizabeth is deciding who is managing her wealth. Um, 
But you made a good choice. I'll let you be the judge of that. Abraham did help to build that patroon ship to its uh, uh, height as he uh, helped administer it after her, uh, her father died. Um, and her younger brother wasn't old enough to be the uh, patroon yet. Now, in 1764, the year after they're married, they acquire this property here from the Patroon. Uh, the original property is five acres. We're very lucky to have 80% of that uh, landscape here. Um, so the original property touched all four of our cross streets. So uh, Tembrook Place to the south, Tembrook Street to the east, uh, Livingston to the north, and then all the way up our pathway on the other side of our parking lot up to North Swan Street. Um, so in a city, that's a large amount of land. Uh, and this was not a city, however, when they moved here. Um, be it much, much later than uh, their acquisition of the land here. Um, this was not going to be a working farm by any means. This was to be a gentleman's country estate. That's what they were looking to have built here. Um, now the first people working on the land were um, some of the Tembrooks enslaved, as well as um, most likely master gardeners of African descent. Um, there's a very rich tradition of uh, master gardeners coming from Africa and helping to start gardens and orchards and things. And, um, we know that the Tembrooks had an orchard and other uh, gardens and things. Um, so while not a working farm, you certainly wanted things that were going to be you know, fresh for the kitchen. Those would have been grown on site. Um, now, the building itself, or the mansion itself, was completed in 1798. Uh, so there's a little bit of a hiccup there uh, with the revolution. Hmm. Um, and uh, some supply chain issues, I'm sure, <laughs> as well as labor shortages. Um, now, the mansion itself, it's attributed to Albany architect Philip Hooker. Uh, if you're familiar with architecture, Hooker is to Albany what Bullfinch is to Boston. There's lots of uh, Philip Hooker buildings here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the exact plans for this building or the any contracts, but it matches up very closely to many of the buildings that he, uh, or houses he created, and he was one of uh, two or three active architects in the Albany region, and the only one who was most likely uh, would have been uh, accepting this commission at the time. Now, if you look at the house, you can ignore the uh, southern addition there, um, and it's a very symmetrical house. Um, Philip Hooker built in a neat, neat, plain, modern style, he advertised. Um, so that was very symmetrical, very federal and English style. Um, now the mansion was in relationship with the landscape itself. Um, so in addition to being 50 feet long, there was two formal outbuildings or dependencies, approximately 50 feet to the northwest and southwest. Um, so the Northwest Independency stood right under our, where our silver maple is, uh, and that was the wood storage and necessary. Familiar with necessaries? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, and the Southern Dependency uh, stood right uh, with its west wall in our shade garden here with the hostas. Mm. Um, and that was the living and working space and the kitchen uh, for the property. Uh, and we're living and working space for their enslaved and the property's kitchen. Mm. So the kitchen, they had nothing inside for the bathroom or the kitchen? Correct. So they most likely they probably had chamber pots and things. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as inside, the Tenbrooks did not have any uh, kitchen. Um, I'm sure they could have heated things up on a fireplace or something. But I, I'm not, just there was no, no formal kitchen inside. Uh, no. What are the necessities, just out of curiosity? The dependencies? <laughs> so the North Dependency was wood storage. Oh, and dependencies. Necessary. What were the dependencies? So the dependent, that's just the, the name for a formal outbuilding. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So All right. not like shacks or something that you might be uh, more akin to see in southern plantation slavery. They were formal buildings. They would have been um, just like the mansion built of brick and sandstone, painted an ochre yellow color. Um, so it would have been very, at least aesthetically pleasing, if not uh, comforting uh, to live in and work in. Um, any other questions out here before we get in out of the smog? It just surprised me that the kitchen would have been outside at that time because so many of them were in the basement where the servants were. So that was what surprised me when you said the kitchen. So, so just an interesting fact. So we'll head in and uh, the kitchen, uh, they have good reason for having the kitchen outside. Um, they're very fire conscious. Uh, their first uh, home, Abraham and Elizabeth's home in Albany, burned down in 1797. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So very fire conscious. Uh, we really want uh, kitchens inside, as kitchens are one of the most common places fires were started, um, certainly back in these days. Um, there's also a very different idea of what the types of food the Dutch, or uh, the Tembrooks and the Dutch would have been eating. Whereas uh, 
during the later periods of the, when the house was occupied. Um, during the Victorian period, you have, you know, food is various ranges of temperatures. The Timbrooks and the Dutch, they're mostly temperate food. That they didn't, uh, you know, even meats and things were eaten at room temperature. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll head right up to the glass front doors. They're a wonderful landscape crew at work. <laughs> um, now, Abraham and Elizabeth, uh, when they had this house built, it would have been, of course, in the countryside. So these row houses across the street did not exist. Uh, they would have been surprised that the uh, city is caught up with them by now. Um, but would have been beautiful views out over the Hudson, which would have actually been much wider and very bustling at the time. Um, nice views out over the uh, other uh, to. Uh, Rensselaer County and uh, to his, their, uh, Elizabeth's family's estates uh, to the south, you would have seen the city of Albany. Um, beautiful views from up here on a hill, very intentionally built up here. Um, intentional because of Abraham's travels abroad. Uh, at the age of 17, he travels to Europe. Um, now, he's there ostensibly to study business and banking, uh, but he's at the time of a grand tour. So he's seeing French chateaus, Italian villas, English country estates, landscapes created by people like Cape Ability Brown. Mm. Um, so he's absorbing all of this culture as well as making business connections and things like that. And he comes back and when he can finally have a nice estate put up, he takes that culture and applies it, those principles here. So it's all about views of the home, but also from the home. Um, so very beautiful, beautiful surroundings they would have cultivated for themselves. At 17 years old. Whoa. We wouldn't send our kids out now to be doing all of that at 17. No, probably not. Um, now here he is, here, Abraham. Uh, this portrait was painted of him uh, in 1796 by a French artist by the name of Monsieur Robert. We don't know his first name, just Mr. Roberts. Hmm. Um, what do you think Abraham was trying to tell us about himself with his portrait like this? He was successful. Business. Business. That, that's what I get from it anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. No wrong answers. Anything about his pose remind you of anything? Bad back? No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you're right. It's all about his businessmen. He's signing. It's all about his uh, doing mental labor, not physical labor. Um, he's literally signing banknotes. Um, he was the president of the First Bank of Albany, mm. um, banking at the time, very much an elite endeavor, not for the everyday person. Um, but I asked about his pose, uh, because he's what is commonly, uh, striking is what is commonly called a signer's pose. Oh. So if you think of pictures of George Washington or the other signers of the Declaration of That's Independence, <laughs> it's very much similar. Okay. Um, while he did not sign either of those documents, um, we didn't know all of, or many of those men, I should say. He welcomed George Washington here to Albany following the war. Um, so he's connecting himself with that founding generation. He's uh, maybe not a founding father, but a founding uncle or brother. <laughs> um, he led troops at Saratoga, so he was very much a part of that generation, if not um, considered a founder of the country. He's certainly a founder here in Albany of, mm. of the post-colonial era. Mm. It's, I was going to say George Washington when you said that, but I can't literally think of a picture of him sitting it must just be floating in there somewhere right it's my you know george washington it's also often the face and a bit of the uh little paunch in the middle is mm -hmm. uh more of george washington-esque you might you know ben franklin or other signers yeah, yeah. the yeah. signers pose that's kind of interesting yeah yeah um, now we will head into the dining room to the right here we just ask that you keep uh, or stay between the yellow lines on the floor. And any of the chairs, uh, the gold chairs with the black cushions, those are if you would like to have a seat. And welcome here to the dining room. Um, here is Abraham here again, albeit much younger, uh, there on the right. Um, and here is Elizabeth. Um, these were painted in 1763, shortly before their marriage, uh, painted by a Scottish artist by the name of Thomas McGlory. Um, I asked about Abraham in the hallway, but what do you think of Elizabeth? What is Elizabeth telling us about herself? First word that comes to mind is stoic. It, he has a little grin and she does not. And her clothing. Well, the fact that she's marrying down 
to in a certain extent. She doesn't look like someone that was somebody's first pick. She, I I cannot speak to that. Um, whether first or well, well, I'm no, just no, well, I when you think of some of the other ones that you see paintings of, they're more striking. I'm not saying she's not attractive. She's just not very striking. So she is actually very much her uh, certainly facial structure very similar to the way other Van Rensselaers are painted. Uh, um, so it's uh, could be a bit of both. Um, now with Elizabeth, it is stoic. She's all about her status, power, very wealthy. Um, you can see she's got three strands of pearls there on her neck. Mm -hmm. um, those would have been immensely expensive. Those would have uh, had to travel from Asia over to Europe and then back to the Americas. Darn colonial trade laws. Yeah. Um, what do you think the second most expensive thing she's wearing is? The dress. I was going to say the dress. Yeah. So it's actually the lace. Um, you know, to be fair, if you thought it was all one thing, I agree with you. Uh, it took me weeks to notice there were two separate things. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's like a shawl. So, yeah, she's got a little bit of a cape going on. Okay. I uh, thought that was all part of it. I did, yeah, too. so did I when I first started. Uh, so that would have been incredibly expensive, all handmade. Um, so incredibly, incredibly expensive uh, clothing that she's wearing. The dress certainly would have been silk and very expensive as well. Um, all her bows and things. Uh, she's also telling us about what she's doing. Um, certainly she may not have been dressed like that every day, but being afforded uh, to be able to be painted like that, you certainly would have dressed very nicely. She's not doing any labor. Mm. Um, as I mentioned outside, the Tenbergs did sadly and wrongly uh, own or enslave African Americans. Uh, we know from the 1790 census for four Tenberg family members, there were 12 enslaved on the property at their home in Albany. Mm. Um, that does not include any other enslaved on other properties that they owned. Um, so it would have been all of the enslaved labor that went into making their lives possible, keeping these rooms beautiful, cooking the meals and everything. Um, one woman who uh, we know was enslaved here at Tembrook Mansion, uh, her name is Susanna. Uh, Susanna, she was the daughter of an uh, enslaved uh, couple who um, her mother was enslaved here at the Tenbrook, or by the Tenbrooks. Uh, her father was enslaved uh, by the Schuylers. His name was Will. His mother's name is Britt. Or, or her mother's name is Britt. Um, and uh, we know a bit about her, uh, largely because in 1810, following Abraham's death, uh, Elizabeth writes a document that is rather strange. Uh, she manumits Susanna, writing, I hereby manumit my good and faithful servant Susanna. Um, However, she has some stipulations for that manumission. Uh, she has to come back once a week without fail to wait on me, uh, come back at whitewashing time, at uh, sausage-making time or killing time, as it was often mm -hmm. called, um, at other times throughout the week and year. Um, no guarantee of pay or anything. Um, you have to come back and wait on me. Hmm. Um, now, we have been in dialogue with other scholars and our guests. Um, how would you term that arrangement? More like an indentured servitude. Pretty unfair. Well, yeah, yeah. So we have uh, started um, the conversation. It's been referred to as partial manumission. In, in the past, we have uh, begun using partial enslavement. Yeah, yeah. Now, Susanna and her three daughters did not have to wait terribly long uh, to, for that arrangement to end. Uh, Elizabeth dies in 1813. Um, and then we, uh, following about 1820, we don't have any more information about Susanna and her family. Um, the house very quickly uh, goes out of the Tenbrook family. None of their children who survived wanted it. Um, and it very quickly passed through the Kane, King, and Merchant families. They're all business and banking families here in Albany. Uh, they're responsible for some of the architectural changes, like the Greek revival fireplace, or not Greek, Egyptian revival fireplace behind you. Um, as well as the Greek Revival columns in, in the front parlor, in the parlors as well. Um, and then, finally, the family who lived here the longest for 100 years, that was the Alcott family. They moved in 1848. Uh, they were Quakers and abolitionists, very different from the Tenbrooks. Yeah. Uh, and we will meet their house manager in the butler's pantry, unless there's any questions. Alcott, uh, A-L-C or O? O-L-C, O-L-C-O-T-T. Eric, uh, okay, yeah. Trina's yep. question. Wow. Is this uh, part of what they had, or is 
Uh, um, so, just... so all of our furniture um, is things that were donated after the fact. So our period of interpretation essentially goes from uh, when it was built, 1798, about until 1875. Okay. Um, so we have pieces that represent both colonial period as well as more Victorian and um, mm -hmm. uh, industrial industrial period or industrialization. So mm -hmm. uh, everything has largely been donated in. Um, Actually, the uh, silver, uh, the dishware on the, um, the plates here on the table, as well as the uh, serving dishes, those were a recent acquisition um, from the Van Allen family, who were bankers here in Albany as well. They were contemporaries of the Olcotts. Um, we, do, we know they knew each other, at least uh, in the banking world. We don't know if they're necessarily friends. But. So you don't necessarily have things that belong to the town. So we don't. Have so many people in between. Right. And... With the Tenbrooks, after several fires, um, both of their original home and fires at the state capitol in 1911, yeah. um, so large parts of but whether artifacts and things as well as their documents have been lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good thing there were some historians around keeping track of stuff. <laughs> oh, what I wouldn't get for a pantry like this. So this is a butler's pantry, or the butler's pantry. This is that. Uh, southern edition, I said you could ignore when you're outside. Ah, okay. um, so this wall here, you'll notice the uh, door frame is very thick because that's the original oh. end of the wall. Oh. Yeah. Um, Philip Hooker buildings, uh, most buildings of this style were built with two bricks deep. Philip Hooker's buildings are three. Um, so very wide, very stable. Um, so the Alcotts, uh, when they moved in, they demolished the southern dependency. Um, the kitchen then did move downstairs. Um, for the Alcotts, um, and then they built the first floor here uh, and the sister room below us. Um, and this became the butler's pantry, and this was uh, the working at domain and uh, of this woman here. This is a reproduction tin type of a woman named Rosanna Vosberg. Um, she was their house manager, uh, so this would have been her primary working space. She would have been uh, overseeing a staff of not only other African Americans, but also Irish servants as well. Um, Rosanna, she was uh, born in Columbia County. She was born in 1800. Um, she was uh, born into slavery uh, at the age of 21. She uh, gained her freedom and came to work for the Alcotts. Um, she worked for the Alcotts for 63 years, um, so quite a long time, especially when she was allowed to leave if she chose. Um, so she was, by all accounts, treated well and paid well. Um, we know that in the uh, 1830s, she helped found the Female Lundy Society here in Albany, which was an abolition and education society. Um, so very big into charity. Um, you see all the keyholes here. Those would have been her keys as she's managing the staff and making sure everything is running it's like a tight ship. Mm -hmm. um, she was incredibly important to the Alcott family. Um, we know that when she died, she was actually buried in the Alcott family plot in um, Albany Laurel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at the end of her life, uh, she set up essentially a trust or small charity uh, using essentially a small fortune that she earned from the Alcotts. Um, set up a charity for the other leading and up and coming African American women here in Albany. Um, and left that for the Alcotts to administer as she knew that they would mm. uh, abide by her wishes for her, for her wealth. Did she live on premises? Yes, she did. She had a room upstairs. Mm. Uh, up on the third floor. Um, it, so there's a few uh, technological changes throughout the years uh, in this room, okay. uh, not even including the uh, appliances, which would <laughs> never have been here. Right. Um, so this is a uh, plate warmer. Um, so you notice all the cabinets are on the outside of the house. Um, they're not very well insulated. It's very cold. Um, and as I mentioned on our way in, um, Tenbrooks, they were eating much more temperate food. They didn't need things to be very, very hot or very, very cold. Um, the Alcotts, when they move in, they are very interested. Or the food ways have changed. Um, with lots of gravies and jellies and things. You want things to be very, very hot um, during the Victorian period. Um, so this is from the 1880s. Um, so food would be brought up with the dumb waiter, which our remains are above the fridge. Um, so food would be brought up. Um, and then plates, if it was cold or you didn't want them to be going on even just a room temperature plate, you'd uh, stick them in here and they're connected uh, under the, or was connected under the floor to the uh, radiator here. Mm. Um, so it's all steam, heat, and pipes. And then you 
get those plates up to two or three hundred degrees very quickly. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this these are uh, renovations just to look like they fit in, but they would have been all cupboards. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Because the dumb waiter would have had to come. To yes, the dumb waiter would have uh, been opening. You can see uh, actually the hinges. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can see the uh, original end uh, end of the wall that masonry there um, in the brick in, up in the. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Dumb waiter there. Yeah. And that uh, that pipe is actually a gutter that still works. Uh, the first time I it, I was in here and it was raining, I didn't know that it worked. <laughs> I was just hearing running water and was terrified. Ah, uh, I bet. It, this opening up here is. Um. So there would have been this opening up here, as you can see, they would have uh, most likely been storing crocs and other things up on up on top there. Whoops. That one just looks like it goes way back. I just thought it might be part of another room, but I should see where you would definitely use it for. So this room uh, originally would have stretched all the way. So if you can see um, oh, yes. behind the doors there, the open doors. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, the bathroom, I'm going to blank on when that was added in um, after we became a museum. So they oh. basically took out sure. an end of it. So that extends further, but it would have gone all the way around. Mm. All right, we can head into the Alcott dining room. Okay. We're going to do a bit of time traveling in here as this room has gone through several renovations uh, throughout the years. Um, as originally built, this room was much, much smaller um, during the timber period of the home. Um, if you notice on the uh, floor, right at the corner of the table here, there's a black marker. Mm -hmm. um, so from that black marker on the floor there to the north wall, that would have been all walled off. It was a service staircase that ran from the basement up to the second floor. Um, so for the Tenbrooks, their enslaved could not share their stairs. Mm -hmm. um, you also notice in this room, there's no fireplace in here compared to the other rooms. Um, you may also notice this wall is concave. Mm -hmm. um, now, being very fire conscious, Abraham and Elizabeth, uh, this would have been a, a wood stove, maybe an early Franklin stove sitting here, right in front of the doorway there. Um, so it would have been a much smaller room, uh, most likely functioned as an office for Abraham. Oh. When the Olcots move in, they have the service staircase removed, and this becomes a familial dining room. They don't need a big formal dining room for every, every day, especially if there's just a couple people uh, in the home. Um, here are the Alcotts. This is uh, Thomas Worth Alcott and his wife Caroline Dwight Papoon Alcott. Uh, Thomas here, he was the son of a Quaker, uh, born over in Hudson, New York. Um, he was known as a boy genius. Uh, at the age of 14, he goes to work at a bank as a teller. Uh, and by 18, he is the bank manager. Oh I don't know how you feel about children doing your bank. <laughs> you're a genius, maybe you're good at it, I don't know. Um, in addition to being a boy genius, he was known to be a very, very good banker. Um, he was actually invited to be in uh, Lincoln's cabinet during the Civil War uh, to be comptroller of the currency, a position he turned down, wow. uh, saying he would do better to stabilize banking outside the federal government. Um, in addition to that, he was also known as one of the most charitable men here, in, uh, or the most charitable man here in Albany. Um, he was uh, big into giving to schools. He was on the board of both the Albany Academy for Boys and Girls. He helped fund the Dudley Observatory. Um, one of the largest acts of charity that we know of uh, that he uh, committed or was uh, the donation or purchase of a bank uh, fought during the construction of the Erie Canal. Um, at the time, the Erie Canal was being built uh, and banks are opening up. It's very easy to be an unscrupulous banker and take the money you want. Um, one of these banks was catering to canal workers and essentially defrauded its customers, took all their money and left. Uh, Thomas here heard about that and he bought that bank out of pocket. Not because it's a good business investment, uh, he just wants new ledger books. Uh, so he then went through each of the ledgers, uh, repaid each person what they deposited plus interest out of his own pocket. Wow. Um, so fairly generous person. Very Quaker-like. The thing that surprises me is living in a house like this as a Quaker. That seems counterintuitive to me. The Quakers were more simple in their lifestyles, as what I understand. 
That doesn't mean I'm right. <laughs> I, I would largely agree with you and think. I think potentially at the time he is he may not have been a practicing Quaker. He may have been raised as a Quaker with those ideals. Um, but then he went into banking and um, he eventually became president of Mechanics and Farmers Bank Bureau. And so by time Thomas goes into banking, much different from Abraham's banking industry when it's only the elites during the colonial period now mm -hmm. mechanics and farmers are banking. Maybe. Not, she was practicing Quaker. Her clothing is a giveaway. I mean, if you compare yeah. to other women, right. pictures of the time. <laughs> Well, maybe he wasn't as ostentatious as other rich people, so his Quakerness came out maybe. in that he didn't have a lot of stuff around and he was simple as far as a rich person would go. It's a simple rich person. Hard to say, but it's interesting. His generosity is mm -hmm. admirable. Now we're going to head back through the center hall here, so we're going to take a right and go back towards those glass doors. Before we head into the parlor, we'll point out the uh, early doorbell system that was that was here. Um, you'll notice there's not a bell up here. It's ringing downstairs. It was answering the Ten Brooks and the Olcott's doors. Not either of the, or any of those family members, certainly. Um, Ten Brooks would have, of course, been their enslaved. Olcott's their servants. Um, so rang downstairs. Um, there was a uh, servant by the name, or uh, yes, servant by the name of Robert Roberts, who worked over uh, for the Gore family in Massachusetts. Um, who essentially, in addition to being a servant, he eventually became a sort of entrepreneur as well um, and a writer. He wrote a book called *The House Servants' Directory*, giving instructions on how to properly perform tasks and organize your day and schedule, and also telling uh, employers how they could better treat their uh, employees. Um, what sort of work they should expect. Um, one of the things he says about doorbells is don't let them ring twice. <laughs> Which, if you're running upstairs from the basement, might be hard to do. Yeah. Um, but of course you would be uh, led into the house and then uh, led into the parlors here to be greeted by uh, whomever you were visiting, if you were visiting a ten worker and all that. The music we have on in here, uh, it was actually performed in this room last year. Um, mm -hmm. Just a mix of pieces. I think uh, this is just one, uh, a four line on repeat, but um, we had a, a bard professor record uh, several uh, pieces in here to have a CD made that we'll eventually be selling in our shop. Um, now, parlors, um, often associated with women, especially. Uh, during the Victorian period, as industrialization sits, uh, sets in, um, as the working sphere becomes more and more associated with men outside the home, uh, the home, the domestic sphere associated with women. Uh, now, upper class and middle class women are the ones enjoying parlors like this, not so much the working class women. Um, those upper and upper middle and upper middle class women, what are they doing in their parlors? They're not just listening to music or painting or reading, although they certainly did those things. They helped establish abolition groups, education reform movements, um, religious reform movements, so they're contributing to society and leading society in their own right from in the home and influencing it in different ways. Um, one of those women who was uh, involved in those changes uh, was this woman here. This is Anna Benner Tenbrook, two generations down from Abraham and Elizabeth. Uh, would have been about a second cousin um, if you look at the family tree. Um, her portrait, it's painted by Ami Phillips, who's a, a local artist. Um, very different uh, ideas of how she's presenting herself, albeit it's still very expensive to even be painted like that. Um, but for Anna Benner here, it's not about what she looks like or her power and wealth. Uh, it's all about that book she's got tucked under her elbow there. Um, so written on the spine there in very tiny letters, it says uh, it's a book by Isaac Watts. Uh, so she's reading either uh, treaties on religion, she's reading poetry, um, or philosophy. And so her painting, it's all about what she's thinking about, what she's interested in mentally, not her looks and her money. Um, you know, Anna Benner here, she uh, was friends with Emma Willard, uh, who started the Troy Female Seminary, not like Emma Willard School across the road. 
Um, so very interested in education, uh, especially women's education. Um, now Anna Benner here, we have three images of her in this room. Um, they are not the other two paintings, um, or three paintings on the wall. It's, uh, Anna Benner here, this is painted by Ami Phillips in 1834. Um, 20 years before that, uh, she had a silhouette made for her here. Um, much simpler uh, way of uh, making a uh, representation of oneself. Um, and then finally, uh, in 1855, uh, she has a daguerreotype photograph of a uh, portrait of her and her uh, husband and two of her children. Um, so if you can't quite see it, it is no. difficult with the mirrored oh, surface. Oh, it is digitized. Oh, just bare. Okay. So Anna Benner is uh, seated here with a bonnet on. So oh, much older later in life. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but, and until I moved in closer and did that glare, you can't. Like, yes, it's you have to have the right angle, and <laughs> uh, but it's because of the uh, so it's uh, basically a tin sheet that's then coated with a silver um, solution that then um, you put that in the camera and it's exposed to light, so there's no negative; it's a direct mm -hmm. um, yeah. direct capture onto the medium, uh, and then it, over time it sort of deteriorates a bit and changes in uh, chemical makeup and things and it becomes a little difficult to see. Mm -hmm. uh, but that and uh, other timber Kramer daguerreotypes are all digitized and online, the ones we have on our yeah. um, We can head into the rear parlor here. And we can get a bit of an idea of how the Alcott's had this room set up from this uh, reproduction of painting here. Uh, in the corner. You can see he's lots of layered carpets, both on the floors and on the tables. He's got a Japanese screen. I'm very interested in the globalized world, global art, Asian art was a particular interest of the Alcott family. Um, the Alcott's during their time here, obviously bankers working with mechanics and farmers, um, more in tune with the Jacksonian sense of democracy, of the average man that is uh, what who democracy is for, not just the rich elites, uh, but what are the Tenbrooks uh, and the Van Rensselaers doing during this time period, the early 1800s? Um, they have to cope as they are the very landed elites who have um, been incredibly wealthy. Um, they decide, well, how are we going to use our land and money and influence uh, to sort of fit into this new uh, democratic system? Uh, and how do they do that? They decide to uh, not just hoard their money or just give it all away. They keep a bit and give some away, as I think the uh, very wealthy do today. Um, to that end, they are interested in scientific agriculture. Uh, so they're interested in how do we stop the feast and famine cycles and how do we um, make better plants and things like that, get better yields. Um, so to that end, the uh, Van Rensselaers, they start RPI across the river. Uh, which was originally more of an agricultural school. Um, <clears throat> the Tenbrooks are also interested in uh, scientific agriculture. This is a portrait here. Um, it's a companion piece to the uh, Anna Benner portrait. This is her husband, uh, Jacob Tenbrook. Um, and like uh, Anna Benner's, it's all about the literature that he's got in his portrait. It's a pamphlet for an agricultural society. So they're interested in um, not just making the world good, uh, a better place for themselves at this point, but being more economic. They, they never lived in this house. They did not. Okay. Um, the Alcotts, uh, as they lived here for an extended period of time, we know, um, I don't know if you noticed, you uh, came under a grape arbor on your way in. Mm -hmm. um, that is historic, although I don't know if that specific arbor is. The Alcotts did have a grape arbor and a grapery oh. uh, as well um, in their greenhouse here. Um, so this is a picture of the Alcott family gardener from the um, 1920s. Uh, so that his name, this is the gardener, his name is Isidore Marx. Um, and then his wife, uh, who was a baker and cook. Um, and then uh, the niece was, uh, or their niece was uh, basically kind of a household manager and um, member of staff uh, here. And then one of the sons, we're not sure which, um, was the mechanic and chauffeur uh, for their car. Actually, one of our board members who is uh, working in the gardens this morning is uh, it's actually her family. Oh. Have you watched any of the Gilded Age? 
I have not, no. Okay. That is, you're, the things you're describing so much sound like what you're Oh, yes. Programming. Um, but it, 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 you know, yes, they actually, um, last year, came and scouted our, our mansion and decided it was not suitable. Uh, largely because we wouldn't let them paint our walls. Uh. Oh, good for you. Yes. Good for you. Yes. Who's that gentleman? Military? Uh, this gentleman here in the corner is Mayor Van, Al uh, Van Alstein um, of Albany. Okay. Um, I want to say his first name is Thomas, but I'm not positive. I recognize the last name. <clears throat> yes, uh, his wife actually donated this china cabinet here. Oh, this is William Van Alstyne, not Thomas. William, okay, <laughs> right in front of us. Oh, his wife donated this. Yes. Been here a while. Um, so we can head right upstairs. We just asked you to use the gray handrail. That's the handrail on the right that you head up. I remember the Christmas tree up in front of that window. And we'll take a quick right into this bedroom here. Right. As we only really have bedrooms up here on the second floor. And we don't know where anyone slept. Um, but I will show you uh, the 1888 edition, uh, which is ah, right in here. Ah. So this is built over the butler's pantry in the 1880s. Um, when plumbing and indoor uh, bathrooms became uh, more regular. Um, it also came at a time when hygiene was uh, more thought of. Uh, so you notice much more hygienic than um, original bathrooms, more to, close to the what we would have a nice bathroom today. Mm. Um, bathrooms originally when they came indoors had lots of rugs and plush curtains and things. And they realized that wasn't quite hygienic and it's difficult to clean. So. Very easy to wipe everything down. There's drains on the floor, under the sink, and next to the toilet. Mm. Um, Interesting. Lots of linen space, so the Alcots certainly would have most likely had their linens being changed every day. Uh, certainly weekly, if not daily. Mm. Um, and originally, uh, when this uh, sister, the uh, bathroom was installed up here, uh, the plumbing was not quite efficient uh, enough, so the cistern here was hand-filled by one of the servants. Mm. Uh, so I had to schlep up a couple buckets of water up the stairs. Hopefully, uh, they didn't use it too often. Well, at eight pounds a gallon, I wouldn't want mm -hmm. that to carry too no. many up. Too yes. Many <laughs> and this is the original house here. Yes. The wide wall. Yeah. Uh, because we do just have bedrooms up here, I'll quickly uh, show you another bit of our, our collection that we uh, have on display here. Mm. So this is a historic Bible from the 1770s. It was owned uh, by a man by the name of Gerd Grosbeck, um, Dutch uh, uh, family. Um, so Bible written in Dutch. You can see this is a we've got all kinds of different maps and things in here. Um, so this is a map of Canaan. Mm -hmm. um, the reason this is on display is not just because it has a very nice map in it. Um, there was very rich traditions, especially in uh, Christian communities, um, for in family Bibles and prayer books that you'd write your um, family histories, uh, marriage, oh, yeah, and birth, yeah. and death records um, in Bibles. So this is um, Gerrit Gospek. So he is he acquired the Bible in the 1770s, but he went back and so he's writing about his birth here. Um, mm. And this is uh, he's writing in Dutch. Um, in the 1770s. Um, so that was his first language, most likely, certainly used at home. Um, then you'll notice here by 1807, uh, it switches to English. Um, Chris's birthday. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible passed on to most likely one of his sons. Uh, while they probably could speak it and probably understood it if they heard it, they could not read or write it. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon here in the Hudson Valley specifically. Um, since this was a very Dutch region, um, where the families 
continued to use Dutch in the home, but it wasn't being learned and taught outside of the home. So um, it, there was a period between the late 1700s and the 1830s when there was a partial understanding of the Dutch language that was still in use. Are those shades on your windows unique? Uh, yes, so that's light protection for the uh, for the artifacts. So um, since the windows it is historic glass, um, we can't replace or won't be replacing those with um, modern windows and things. But so uh, there's the UV shades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is this this is a hallway to another bathroom bedroom set down there? Uh, so that's just the bathroom. Um, so there's four bedrooms on this floor. Okay. Um, so back bedroom or southwest bedroom and then that bathroom would have been uh for the two rooms over here oh, uh, as well as anyone who's upstairs is there's no bathrooms upstairs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, originally this actually would have been this hallway would have had the uh, staircase the service staircase ran uh up to the second floor and then there's a separate set that went up to the third floor oh, okay so we're right over that where that was in the mm -hmm. colors. Uh, so the service staircase was actually would actually most likely have come up Oh, okay. partially in this bedroom. I'm not based on the changes of the house. I have to, I would have to look at our structure report. But, uh, as we look out the window here and we peek into these bedrooms as well, um, talk a little bit about the row houses across the street. Those were put up in the 1830s and 40s by the lumber barons. Um, of course, making their money from the lumber trade in the Adirondacks. Very close to the warehouse district, so it would have been very bustling and busy area of the city. Um, people going to and fro, much like uh, Victor Sherlock Holmes, London. Um, very similar, going to and from work, visiting and things. Um, now Arbor Hill here, the community where it's the second oldest neighborhood in the city of Albany. The name itself on a map uh, dates back to 1789, um, although it was most likely in use prior to that. Um, in addition to being the second oldest, it's also the most diverse, both culturally and economically. Um, We'll go economics first. We, of course, have the Tenbrooks and then the Olcott, so large banking families living in the area, um, as well as uh, merchant families. Uh, you had the lumber barons across the street, um, of course, on a very nice flat road uh, compared to all of the uphill streets, which most likely would have been their employees. Um, but also, we know newspaper owners, silversmiths, blacksmiths, um, porters, everyday workers. So the work range was from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, as far as culturally uh, diverse, we've, uh, prior to the Civil War, there was a, uh, always a large population of free persons of color, color living in the area. Um, following that, there was influx of uh, more African Americans uh, moving north during the Great Migrations. Um, there's also other immigrant populations, Irish, German, English groups lived in the area for, or in the neighborhood for periods of time. There was a Jewish community that lived here in Arbor Hill, so very culturally diverse uh, to this day. It's, it's, mm -hmm. If I may remember correctly, the first black woman to own a house was in Arbor Hill, I believe. I would have to check on that, but I wouldn't count it out. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Interesting. So, uh, well, there's three bathrooms. Yes, so there's uh, a bathroom for the two bedrooms on each side and then one for the two on the other oh, side. Okay. So, get a little bit of a sense as certainly with... Uh, this room, we, bedrooms were used more of a semi-public, semi-private space, as you might have mm -hmm. friends or relatives up for tea, or you're having business associates come by and doing business, or if you're sick, the doctor's going to come visit you while you convalesce. Mm -hmm. so not the solely private rooms as they are today. Kind of a remnant of an England where the, everything happened in the bedroom of the kings. And, right, right. Yeah. And the middle one. Really, a way to Right, very large bedrooms. Uh, excluding the bed, actually, in this room, all of the furniture is made from New York wood, some of which don't exist anymore, thanks to those lumber barriers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kind of Greek in here. Yes, so what would have been, um, so all, all of these rooms would have been wallpapered originally, this is reproduction, um, but certainly that Greek revival style would have been uh, very popular. Mm. Uh, before we head down to the basement, I'll talk a little bit about the upstairs if we uh, go towards them. Upstairs would have been um, 
bedrooms for uh, both the enslaved as well as uh, children if there were any visiting or in the house at the time. Um, and then the Olcott servants would have had their bedrooms up there. We know uh, Rosanna's bedroom was up there. In her bedroom there is a, uh, a sink uh, as well. So at the very least she could, and I don't know if she had a roommate, but they could get a little bit of washing done up there, a little mm -hmm. more privacy. Um, yeah, last time we were here, <laughs> we were the only two at that time, too, yeah. and they took us up to show us. Oh, uh, did you? We're, we are hoping to restore the upstairs right now. It's a little uh, jumbled up with uh, restoration work going on. Yeah, that's, and, and your is your basement restored, too? Yep, we're about to head right oh, down to the basement. Story. Okay, well, I'll, I'll follow you down. I'm a little slower. All right. So please just watch your step on your way down, and your head is well. You're a bit taller than me. And see some of the other uh, call bell wires as we go down that little snake to the room. So it was an electric call bell system. Um, so that call bell system was actually would have been wired to the back. Yes, the whole wire. wire. Um, there was an electric um, system that was uh, installed uh, late 1800s and then um, was eventually pulled out. It's called an enunciator system. It was um, largely I used in hotel to put in that so large, large goals like this one. So. Now this would have been a very busy space down here. This is the powerhouse of the home, basically a little factory. Um, all of uh, Philip Hooker attributed homes. Um, each room in the basement has was uh, attributed to one or given individual tasks that were going to take place there. So you're going to have a knife sharpening and. Uh, cutlery and um, silver polishing that's going to be done in one space, um, darning of linens and boot polishing and things like that, that's going to be done in another space. Um, for the washing dishes, that's going to be done down here in a separate space. Everything with very highly spe uh, specif specificity. No. Specific specified, thank you. <laughs> Each room specified and designated for very specific tasks. Now, if you remember uh, Susanna, she had to come back at whitewashing time. Mm -hmm. um, all of these walls would have been whitewashed, uh, plaster and whitewashed, um, which would have been very bright and also considered cleanly at the time. Uh, would have been swept, uh, swept clean the floor. Um, big windows, lots of light. Um, would have been very, uh, all cots in the temperance, so they want a very, very good work done, so they made it uh, possible to have basically a very good environment to do that work when they're And here on our, on our wine cellar. Now our wine cellar is our, our good 20th century story. Um, started by the Alcott family in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, they started collecting right up until Prohibition when I'm sure, like all good wine cellar owners, there were medicinal purposes only on several bottles. Yeah, that's just what it's for. Um, we can't get away with a full cellar, so they essentially jammed the door shut and left it. Um, Prohibition ended, and it is unclear whether it was used or gotten back into or just left. It's not documented. Um, again, the home itself, or the mansion, the property was donated to the Albany County Historical Association in 1948. Um, none of the furniture was in the house. Uh, everything went. Um, it is unclear whether they forgot about the wine cellar, intended it to go with the house. It is not documented. Um, in the 1970s, it is documented that Workmen doing restoration on the foundation uh, basically broke in, um, or just opened the door, I don't know, um, and found essentially an untouched wine cellar. Um, the association uh, decided to bring in uh, experts, um, tested the wines, any wine that was still drinkable was sold at auction, raising $100,000. All that went into the building itself. Wow. Um, very important for the association is we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so all of our Funding comes from rents and shop mm -hmm. sales and uh, tours like this. So, um, well, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, any questions before we head back upstairs? Thank you. This is pretty yeah. good. Enjoy that. Yeah, thank you. It was a good tour. Oh, thank you. Yes. There's uh, just a short survey upstairs if you're willing. It helps with uh, programming and fundraising. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure. glad to hear that they're continuing to do restoration like the upstairs and stuff. Yes, so the upstairs, that's 
most likely going to be on hold for a little while. We are currently um, in the process of fundraising and then getting the carriage bar rebuilt. Oh, really? Okay. So that was torn down in the 90s um, by order of the city. Mm. Um, so we're hoping to uh, rebuild it as an education center. So we'll be constructing. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. Building of it. Yeah, and would it look like? No, so it'll just be the exterior. Very nice tour. So that is our tour, exploration, um, discovery of the Ten Brook Mansion. I also have a, I'll leave a link, I have a link to a um, LinkedIn, uh, what would I call it, article, that's it, it's a LinkedIn article about this place in the wintertime that has some pictures of... Uh, during Christmas, and it has some pictures of the Christmas trees that are, are there. Um, maybe I'll include that in this, I don't know. But in any case, that was our, our tour of the uh, Tenbrook Mansion. Very informative. The, uh, the uh, Mr. Brandt was very, very knowledgeable. And so I guess I'll just say at this point, uh, please subscribe, ring the bell, uh, tell others, and hit the like button. And hit the, read the description. You never know what else is down there. Certainly more information on, on the mansion. So with that, have a good day.